to Nathan Tallman, Digital Preservation Librarian at Penn State University, who will kick things off for us. Nathan? Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us on the call today. Um, we're going to go through some, some uh, important information about how we can increase accessibility of our digital libraries for our patrons as well as our staff. Um, just some introductions to begin with. Uh, I'm Nathan Tallman, and as Mercy said, I'm Digital Preservation Librarian at Penn State University. And uh, when this uh, presentation uh, was conceptualized, I was also serving as product owner for Digital Collections Access, which we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Um, and also, I have um, uh, many, many dogs, seven dogs and a cat, some of them in the room with me. Um, I will try to keep an eye on that to make sure there isn't a large interruption of barking, but just a forewarn. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, my name is Hanning Chen. I'm product analyst at OCLC, and I work with Content DM. Hello, so I'm Valerie Yaza. I'm a senior user experience designer at OCLC, um, and I am working currently on um, content DM and also resource sharing. So these um, are our roles and mine at the time of product owner, product analyst, and senior user experience designer. These, these might not be established roles in your organizations or an explicit person. Some of these things might be dispersed or it might be an entirely new. Um, but we wanna talk about how some of these roles can have uh, affect uh, the development and accessibility of our digital libraries. Um, because while you might not be familiar with these roles, we all have users who want to use our collections and we want to remove those barriers. Um, it, it helps to, to have some firsthand uh, experience, you know, to how these people and how, how people need to access these collections. Um, if folks were able to do the, the exercise uh, beforehand, maybe in the chat or through the, the show hands, just to give an indication of how many folks were able to, to take uh, the time to do this exercise, um, we're going to do a little video of, of what that might have been like, but I just really encourage everyone to to take the time to to go through that exercise because it's a really interesting um, and enlightening experience if you've never um, gone through something like that before to to really realize the impact accessibility makes when um, you are, are are designing these and are using digital library infrastructure. So this next slide, um, well, it's a slide, and I'm going to switch over to a video is just a um, minute and a half, two minutes or so demonstration of a screen reader. And uh, keyboard navigation is used, the tab and enter keys is used to navigate content. The first half just sort of shows the um, navigation through the interface, and then the second part of the video goes and um, focuses just on the screen, um, so you can see uh, what is active going through each of these. So let me share. The application. Okay. Collection groups. Section collection groups. Link graphic digital dot lib dot usf dot edu. Button link browse collections link about link log on link help. Search by keyword. Edit has auto complete clickable search. Hep wave. Us flowed home all collection group lib dot usf dot browse collections visited link button. Us float search results all collection group about link log up help link, search advanced digital list clickable facets complement English in, in spot Latin show more resort uni, uni, universe university of show more grit resort pop, university of university of street and Smith USF Tampa university show more greater resort subject history visit Western store Digital U, Detective and Education, Show More Group, Resorts, Florida, Tampa, Vis Tampa, United, Tampa Bay, Show More Group, Resorts of Serial Vis Photo, Oral, Online Audio, Vis Oral History, Show More Group, Search by Title Keyword, Clear Link, 
Next page button. Last page button. Missing thumbnail graphic 119 items 3D models digital documentation collection link. Missing thumbnail graphic 45 items Alicia Appleman German photographs. Missing thumbnail graphic 41 items all sports liver. Link. Missing thumbnail graphic 5 items Alvin P. Yorkunas papers link. Missing thumbnail graphic 32 items American Indian. Missing thumbnail graphic 18 items analyzing dramaturgical texts link. Missing thumbnail graphic 57 items. So this is just a, a screen reader. This is just one type of adaptive technologies that is, is used um, to make interfaces accessible. Um, and as you noticed, it took a long time to actually get to the content um, navigating using a screen reader. Um, so it really affects you know, someone's experience in, in using your digital library and also the efficiency that they can experience and getting the content they need for whatever that purpose is. Um, so that's just sort to sort of uh, uh, set the set the tone here of why why this is something important because that is just one type of adaptive technology and one interface, um, and this is a whole ecosystem of things working together. Um, to talk a little bit about product ownership, which I mentioned at the top, which was something that um, I was in the role of uh, previously at Penn State Libraries. Product ownership is something that comes out of the Scrum Agile framework for um, sort of iterative development of software, and it's used for a lot of things other than software development right now. The product owner is sort of uh, a chief stakeholder. They represent uh, a whole variety and community of stakeholders for a particular uh, product or interface or application, and they're really the one who um, sort of sets the vision and prioritizes all of the features that those stakeholders want. They're a central conduit between stakeholders and either the development team or the vendor or service provider who is hosting that infrastructure. And uh, this product owner is in the end ultimately accountable for delivering the maximum value of this application. So if accessibility is something that is a priority for your organization, um, having a product owner who is, is sort of overall prioritizing what is worked on and how that happens for that application, this person has a, a lot of power and authority to make accessibility a priority um, in the work that's done. Okay, um, and so leading from that point as far as um, making it a priority. Um, everyone benefits from a focus on accessibility. Um, a focus on accessibility just benefits everyone. For example, the closed captions on video content, that allows people who might be deaf or hard of hearing to have access to the videos. Um, it's also a better user experience. You're allowing your audience to enjoy the ability um, to enjoy your content, um, regardless of the environment they're in. Um, headings, they clarify the structure of the page, so they make it a little bit more coherent and logical. Um, and including your alt images, um, your alt text on the images and the UI elements. Um, for example, just thinking of like a bad alt text for the image um, shown below, it's that the baseball player hitting a ball at a baseball field is not a descriptive, um, descriptive alt text. A better alt text would be um, David Ortiz of the Boston Red Sox um, batting from home plate at Fenway Park. Um, so you can just see like these little things for um, improving accessibility are really helpful for everybody. Um, and since you can see that our, our focus today is on web accessibility and accessibility in digital library spaces, um, so we have physical spaces that are accessible, but it's also important that our digital spaces um, are accessible as well. Um, if you want some help for guidelines, um, some of the things that we do at OCLC for checking accessibility is consulting the W3C, um, the Web, Ac Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, this is just a, a way to check websites and tools. Um, they provide some toolkits that you can use. Um, one of the ones that we use at OCLC is Site Improve, and that is a, 
a browser plugin that you can use to test the, the accessibility of your site. Um, and just having web accessibility means that you um, are able to, well, the user is able to perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. Um, and it's also important that they're able to contribute to the web. Um, another thing that is a guideline is the universal design. Um, universal design um, is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people regardless of age, sex, um, size, ability, and disability. Um, so there are seven principles to universal design. Um, I won't go through those today, but we do have links at the end that will help you um, look at those things. So there's, uh, we're gonna go through sort of two, two pieces here. One, working with hosted software, software as a service, and how um, you can work to make that as accessible as possible. And then we'll take a look at if you are developing your own software or digital library applications, some things you can do to help increase accessibility of that software. Um, a little bit about the experience at Penn State with Content DM. Um, we had hosted uh, the, the sort of 6.x um, older style of Content DM uh, self hosted for 16 years or so. Um, a few years ago, we were really starting to have some issues with stability and maintenance and keeping that up and running, and sometimes collections wouldn't, wouldn't index properly. And this was sort of an instance that had been um, really running for those 16 years. It had patches and things, but it was never sort of rebuilt or refreshed at any point. And we knew that there were some accessibility issues, but um, with, with that interface, they weren't um, um, totally a barrier because we were using the software. Um, but mobile devices in particular were, were a problem. We were starting to get a lot of feedback that people weren't able to, to use it on, on their devices. And OCLC um, around this time was talking about the hosted version of Content DM with the new responsive interface. And one of the things that they had mentioned was that it was better for accessibility. Um, so when we were sort of looking at what we should do here, we thought, well, this would be a way to improve accessibility and also remove that burden from us on that stability of, and maintenance issues. So we um, asked for a trial and we're working with that. Uh, we put some content in our test instance and we worked with the Penn State IT Accessibility Group um, to do some testing here. The, the IT Accessibility Group at Penn State um, really provides consulting, testing, and training on web accessibility for, for staff and faculty at Penn State. A lot of our central sort of uh, productivity type applications all sort of go through this group. Um, the testing was, was conducted by a, a blind woman using a screen reader. Um, and the results of that test were, were kind of disappointing based on the messaging that we had uh, received. Um, we couldn't get to, this woman couldn't get into a digital collection from the homepage. And almost every element on that page was being read before the results of a search were, much like that video that was shown uh, previously where someone had to tab through all the facets and menu elements before they actually got to some content. And, and this was disappointed and the, and the strongly worded email was, was sent along to, to try to find out, you know, what, what was the disconnect here. And OCLC really listened to this um, message that we were sending, and we really started working together to improve the accessibility of Content DM, um, you know, based on this experience. And we were sharing reports, we were sharing a recording of that session, of that testing. Um, and after that, you know, successive iterations of the Content DM responsive interface um, were released that really addressed those issues and improve the accessibility greatly for, for Content DM responsive interface. Um, and I think what this might show is that, well, there um, can be a tendency to use automated scanners and other software to make sure your, your, con your interface is accessible, but those sometimes miss the boat. Um, a website could technically be accessible to users, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a great user experience. So hands-on accessibility testing is something that's important to, to go through, that you're not just relying on those sort of automated tests, Site Improve and those others, they're, they're very helpful at identifying issues, 
But it's sort of seeing the tree and not the forest when you're uh, thinking about the overall experience. So uh, just to reiterate what Nathan was saying is um, we uh, were, I guess we are really, we feel really fortunate to be able to work with partners to, who offer help to identify issues with our application. Uh, I remember at the time uh, when we uh, had a video conference, and that's probably the first time for many of us on our product team to see someone actually using uh, use a screen reader. So that was a very, very helpful experience. Uh, so before, our developers would probably be following books saying you need to have area labels, you need to have tab orders defined for all the elements on the web page. But we realized when um, actually using a site, um, a person who's using a screen reader, the experience will be totally different. So that that was a great experience, learning experience for all of us. And uh, as the title of this slide indicates, we feel accessibility is still maturing for itself. Um, just from the past couple of years, I would say we're already very lucky to see that we have more and more collective experiences and more guidance regarding accessibility. So that's been very helpful for us to uh, improve our product. Uh, the education of personnel on every link of the product line is still ongoing including us product owners, uh, UI, UX, UI UX designers, developer testing engineers, and uh, administrators, our administrators and end users. But uh, we have a lot more resources to look up and lessons to learn from others now. Um, so uh, the more our team learns about accessibility, the better we can make our product. We realize that accessibility can be quite complex. There are still conflicting theories and uh, recommendations of how to go about accessibility. Um, I, I'd like to give you an example of the use of uh, H1 and proper heading in a web page. So as we all know and agree, uh, having a sound heading structure for a page is crucial for screen reader users. They can get a much better idea of the overall of the page. But when we come to the details about the, how to go about it, some recommend that the site title, usually in the header or the banner, should be H1. But uh, some other will argue that uh, maybe the page title should be H1. So would it be OK to have two H1s on the same page? So there's, there was some debate about going about that. Um, and some recommend that, strongly recommend that there should only be one H1 in each page. But uh, maybe I have a page that uh, has a sidebar with its own structure. Should all headings in that sidebar be um, starting from H1 or automatically downgraded by one level? So these are just uh, uh, some examples of the debate. Um, as we are going, we see more and more understanding of accessibility. So the um, conclusion drawn from the debate are, I feel, are more and more reasonable. Uh, we just have to work with our specific site page and uh, decide what will be the best structure that we should present to our users. OK, um, so just some ways of keeping your website accessible. Um, Nathan is correct. The automation only scratches the surface of accessibility testing. Um, there is a lot of testing that has to be done manually. Um, automation doesn't catch everything. Um, and as far as like the process of accessibility, we do have a process in place at OCLC. 
um, but our process might defer from other institutions. Um, but some of the things that we keep in mind for accessibility, um, I have an image of the contrast checker. Um, that's just making sure that your foreground color and your background color um, are up to the, um, are gonna be able to pass for contrast checking. Um, and then just some helpful stuff as far as when uploading content, um, using descriptive yet simple language for your content, um, giving relevant names to your titles, subjects, and descriptions. Um, and just if you're checking, um, if you're changing any kind of configuration tool that you're using within ContentDM or even other configuration tool within another um, product, just checking that contrast checker, um, checking your colors, um, making sure that your test, site is, test size is medium, um, and that is the intended sizing for the test. So now a little bit about when you are, are developing software or digital library infrastructure um, at your institution. Uh, you're not just taking a product, but you're building a product. Um, so at Penn State, we're working on sort of an internal name right now, Cultural Heritage Objects Repository. Um, this will eventually um, probably replace ContentDM and our, our access side of things, um, but it, it it presents, you know, an opportunity to think about that accessibility from, from the start. Um, we are, are using the Sambera framework here um, that has Blacklight as sort of the, the, the interface application that is used there. And uh, we looked at some of the existing Sambera options or solution bundles, as they're sometimes called, that um, sort of give you an out-of-the-box repository like Haiku, um, Hyrax to some degree. But with each of those, there were some accessibility issues. Um, and we have other Samvera applications at Penn State, so this is why, um, why we're sort of moving towards there. And knowing accessibility was a priority for us, um, this was something, you know, we were able to make a required feature from day one. A lot of times when developing software, accessibility is sort of relegated to an uh, uh, end or sort of last phase where we are retrofitting whatever has been built to make it accessible. Um, we were taking the approach that accessibility is, is something that, you know, we're working on every increment. Every time we were doing a sprint to, to build the software, we do accessibility testing. At every major release, we would have accessibility testing ourselves, but also bring in that um, EIT or Penn State Accessibility Group again. So we're always testing accessibility that no new development has broken or, or in some way downgraded the accessibility of the application. Um, the MVP or minimum viable product um, for our initial sort of 1.0 release has really minimal JavaScript and other sort of fancy user interface features uh, because we always want to have a base of accessibility that if someone doesn't have JavaScript or if they're using a, an adaptive technology um, that doesn't uh, enact or, or uh, actuate some of that JavaScript, or use some sort of fancy user interface things. Um, those, you know, those are nice to have, but, but you always want to have a fallback layer of an accessible interface. So this is sort of the principle of graceful degradation or progressive enhancement. Um, and staff need an accessible interface too. This is something that is sometimes overlooked. Um, you know, we tend to focus on users and the patron public side of things. But um, we need accessible interfaces for our colleagues and our employees. You know, we employ all types of people in our organizations, and some might have uh, impairments of some sort. Um, we, people might want to be working in our organizations, but, but haven't applied because they think that they wouldn't be able to do the job. So we really want to make sure we are providing accessible interfaces to our colleagues as well. And anyone can become temporarily um, impaired in some way. You know, you could have a, a broken arm. Um, you could have a temporary loss of vision. Um, so there are, are different, um, the, the, the bucket of what, you know, falls under accessibility can be quite large because, as was already mentioned, you know, accessibility tends to improve the user experience for everyone. So to sort of um, distill some, some best practices from um, the conversation today, 
you know, taking a look at when you're adapting software, um, if you have some sort of software as a service, you're, you know, you have a, a vendor or service provider, um, some things you can do to help maintain or increase accessibility for that software um, is always test all the claims. You know, if, if, if a vendor claims that their software is fully accessible, well, test it, you know, and do some of that, you know, machine-based testing or automated testing, but always make sure you're, you're balancing that with a human testing as well. Um, and if those claims aren't met, don't be reluctant to, to ask or to give feedback or to point that out to, to whoever is providing that software. I think sometimes, um, you know, in the library and information profession, we might be hesitant to, to push back and just sort of go for a different option or alternative. Um, but, you know, the Penn State experience, I think, was really great that we did mention something, you know, to the development here at OCLC, and it resulted in an improvement of the product that benefits all users of, of the software, not just our users at Penn State. Um, when you're customizing software, um, as Valerie talked about, be careful that you don't um, sort of reverse that accessibility or, or unintentionally degrade that experience for, for users with impairments. Um, a lot of times there's that initial base software out of the box has accessibility, but when you start customizing it for your institution and you put it new colors, new headers, um, and you do make some other sort of tweaks that you know, are helpful for, for your users, just be careful you're doing that in a way that doesn't undo the accessibility. You always want to test those customizations, you know, um, with some software like Site Improve. It's a Chrome extension. It's been mentioned a couple times here. Um, there are, are various tools out there that do this sort of activity that, that um, scan your code for uh, accessible issues. There are some commercial ones. There are some free ones. Um, and they're really just looking at the markup a lot of times, which is why they can miss the overall experience and you need a person there because they're just looking at the code. Does the code have the right attributes? Is it in the right place to make sense? Um, whereas, you know, really what you experience, um, you know, if you're using a web browser, you know, that's sort of a rendered interface that all that code, your browser is enacting to make it an experience for you. And that browser experience for able persons, you know, might be familiar, but different people who use adaptive technology um, will be having a different experience because it's not a browser that's rendering that site for them. It's their adaptive technology and maybe the browser as well. Um, and accessibility is always evolving. It's an iterative process where you're working to make your products accessible, your platforms and applications to your users. And there you know, are new, new ideas coming forward about how we can achieve this. Universal design, which is mentioned, is a really great, great approach, right? Where you're, you're trying to build something that is, is useful for all users, regardless of where they're coming from. When you're creating software, um, there are a number of things here. So universal design, um, as was just mentioned, this, this idea that you are building the software so that, you know, no matter who or how you're using it, um, it works for you. So responsive design is, you know, probably could be some under the umbrella of universal design, which is a bit broader. Universal design is also a concept that applies to our physical spaces, um, you know, how we are designing those buildings. Um, so, so that's something to take a look at. Progressive enhancement, sometimes called graceful degradation, you always want to have fallbacks of accessibility so that if your fancy UI element, um, so a drag and drop interface for uploading files, for example, um, you want to make sure that that is accessible. And if it's not accessible, that the code defaults back to some version of the uh, ability that is accessible. So you sort of, you know, that's why at Penn State we sort of had that initial um, MVP was really not having sort of fancy user interface elements that make a site really snappy and people expect these days in a lot of ways because we always want to have an accessible layer that people can use. Um, always do that routine testing. Make that part of your development process. Um, if you're using Scrum Agile, you're probably working in, in sprints or, you know, maybe two or three week increments that build up to, to release a product always have testing as part of what you're working on in that sprint um, and continually improving. And as the application develops, 
you might do some of that reversing as well. So you want to be checking along the way that what was once accessible hasn't suddenly become um, inaccessible later on as you've developed the application. And as Hanny was pointing out, you know, the valid HTML semantic encoding, um, and not just HTML, your CSS, JavaScript, whatever language and protocols you're using to build your application, code that in the way it was intended to. Because these adaptive technologies rely on that standard to, to be expecting where um, certain information is that they can queue off from to, to render that in an accessible way with uh, whatever, you know, if it's a screen reader or, or um, there's different technologies as well. That can make a big difference. Um, similarly, Unicode, so UTF-8 is, is um, oftentimes how this is referred to. So it's sort of accessibility for languages to try to reduce you know, weird characters showing up because of character encoding issues. Um, a lot of sort of default um, these days, more and more is shifting to UTF-8, but sometimes you still see that Western Latin um, sort of character encoding that was a little more dominant, you know, a decade ago. But in the web environment, we really want to be using Unicode text so that no matter who's, what language someone might be using, um, or trying to translate to that, that characters translate as well as possible. Um, some things that have been mentioned, alt text and ARIA attributes. Um, ARIA is the Accessible Rich Internet Application Standard, and it's a specifically uh, a way you can code to um, sort of communicate to that adaptive technology to, to say, this is, you know, unimportant um, interface element, or sometimes in code you have sort of hidden elements that aren't displayed but might be called into place later. Um, you want to sort of indicate using these ARIA attributes that, you know, the screen reader or whatever technology doesn't need to pay attention to this. You want to be make sure you give an option to skip to right to the content, right to the main content, so that going back to that video demonstration, having to cycle through, you know, 30 some um, elements before you actually get to that content, whereas if you just sort of had your first or second tab um, activate a skip to the main content, that makes it a lot easier for someone who has to, to use the uh, digital library that way. When you are testing, um, try it without CSS and JavaScript enabled. Um, some of these adaptive technologies uh, don't or can't make use of those in the same way, and so you want to make sure you're not somehow interfering again with that accessibility um, for the wide variety of adaptive technologies that might be used. Um, and, oh, I already covered the last one. So screen readers, you want to, to specify using those ARIA attributes that this is hidden content that doesn't need to be read um, and to skip, give an option to go straight to that primary content. Okay, um, so this is just some of the resources that were mentioned um, throughout the presentation. Um, just the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. They have a lot of helpful resources for accessibility evaluation. Um, they have a huge list of evaluation tools um, that are available. Um, and they also have a really nice web accessibility perspective video on YouTube. It's about seven minutes long, um, but it just you know, it goes over how important web accessibility is. Um, there is a link to the Universal Design um, website, and I've also provided the Web AIM um, Contrast Checker site. Thinking back for a second on the the sort of roles that we introduced ourselves and. In, um, that product owner role really oh. has the the ability to to you know make these things a priority that you are using these, these screen readers and these approaches. So if you don't have this concept in your um, organizations and your teams, it's really something to think about and to take a look at and to see is that something that can, can help um, in other areas as well as accessibility. So this uh, sort of concludes the main portion of our, our presentation and we're, we're happy to um, discuss these topics or to take questions uh, and I think Mercy might be coordinating some of that questions. Yes, so thank you, Nathan, Hanning, Valerie, for sharing all of that. Um, you've given us a lot of resources and, and things to think about. So 
this point, uh, really we're opening up uh, the presentation to you all. Um, uh, let you all uh, you know, give, give you some time to formulate some questions. Um, perhaps you have some follow-up items uh, that you, you have for our panelists. Um, but uh, just to get us started, we'd be curious to hear, as, as Marilee has shared here, um, we'd be curious to hear, and you can just share via chat, um, if uh, any of you had tried using a screen reader for a day, as, as was suggested, or if you've had an opportunity to try that before, um, or really uh, experimenting with any of those first, um, any of those adaptive technologies firsthand. Um, if you have, we'd, we'd love to hear uh, any questions or comments you, you have about um, that experience. Uh, so um, looking forward to hearing uh, your comments on that. Um, we do have a question here. Um, most of this presentation focuses on uh, building websites and tools. And uh, I'm curious about resources for accessible description along the lines of the example photo. Um, Nathan, would you have any? Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, I just lost my WebEx here. There we go. Um, so there is a really helpful use for you resource here from University of Michigan that I'm just pasting into the chat um, called Describing Visual Resources Toolkit. Um, and this really goes back to, you know, some of that idea of the alt text. And, and a lot of times alt text is, is misinterpreted as to what it's supposed to be used for. Um, so we have this picture here of, of one of my dogs. Um, you know, an alt text for this, you know, really should be a visual description of what someone's seeing. So, you know, a, a Rottweiler in the snow with its tongue sticking out and, and snow on the body. Um, it can be, it's a really, it's a literal visual description. And this can be a little, um, uh, it can take a while to sort of develop your um, language and, and really getting the right things. And this toolkit, um, which was partly created for ebook authors, um, is really helpful and gives you some practical advice on how you can think about these descriptions and, and um, some, some vocabularies and ways to express that. Thank you. That was a, an excellent question, and, and thanks, Nathan, for sharing that resource. Um, obviously, uh, this is a, a huge topic and many ways in which um, we need, need to be thinking about uh, constantly applying that lens of how can we make uh, things more accessible. Um, so obviously acknowledging that um, uh, it can be, as, as I think somebody shared, um, once you've tried really accessing your website um, via some of these adaptive technologies, uh, you understand for the visually impaired um, that it can be really, really challenging um, what your um, website or digital libraries, um, what exploring them, what that experience is like. Um, and also acknowledging that um, so, so many aspects of, of what we do. So for example, this educational experience um, uh, you know, is difficult for um, or, you know, wouldn't be accessible for someone who is uh, hearing impaired right now in the live presentation. Um, afterwards, you know, there's an option to um, add the closed captioning uh, to the recording, but there are so many aspects of the work that we do that we constantly do need to learn about uh, what we need to improve, um, what, where we need to uh, find ways to be better about serving a wide range of audiences uh, through accessible practices. So um, you've really uh, helped us uh, think about that. And so again, I, we just encourage all of you all to um, demo uh, some of those um, adaptive technologies, uh, I would say, for yourself and your, your colleagues to, to be sharing that. Um, and then we have another question here about what might be important accessibility considerations in building metadata schemas? Do you have any thoughts on that? Any of our panelists? Well, it's... Um... I'm not quite sure how to answer that one, to be honest. You know, um, so how are people actually building that metadata schema? How is it that they are assigning metadata values? Um, you know, so, so the sort of the, 
the tool that they're using to, to work with that schema and build the schema, is that itself accessible or accessible with an adaptive technology? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, that's, probably, that's a good follow-up question there to get a little more uh, clarity on, on that, Nathan. Um, so in the meantime, we'll move on to the uh, next question, which is, I'm wondering if you all have any tips for working with an understaffed IT department to make websites more accessible, particularly when you can't make changes to the websites yourselves um, and have to rely on IT. Any suggestions around that? Um, I'd like to say a few things about that. Uh, um, I, I think for the understaffed part, I'm, I'm thinking probably everywhere it's uh, the same situation. We're facing the same difficulties. Uh, but uh, I guess from um, the, corp uh, the point of view of cooperation between you and your IT department, it's always a um, not the totally relying on them relationship. It's that if you understand more, and the more you understand, the more you can help them. Uh, so, for my from my personal experience, I uh, know really minimal about accessibility before I start to uh, before I was assigned uh, as sort of product owner role for accessibility of content DM, and uh, the more I look into it, the more I feel I can help guide the uh, our developers uh, what what's the important improvements that takes more pri higher priority and what's less important if you are having a critical uh, staff time that will be very helpful for you to uh, be the guide in that matter and uh, it's accessibility as we all know is always fighting with other priorities as well so uh, it's really um, using the resources that's available now online and everywhere and uh, um, just figure out the most important things that you need to take care of first. To, uh, go ahead, Nathan. Um, just to add a little bit to uh, Henning's response there, um, there, it's, there are actually you know, laws and statutes in place that require um, levels of accessibility. And if you receive any sort of federal funding, you are um, you can be held liable for these. And the Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights um, is starting to sue organizations, including universities, um, for having inaccessible content. A lot of times it's focused on course materials, but a couple of recent cases have involved massive online video sets, um, which I know there's an upcoming question here about. Uh, so some things to take a look at, um, you know, that if you're trying to convince people to, to work on these issues is that, you know, a, a big stick really is the law. Um, Section 508, um, you know, it really talks a lot about um, why, you know, and the reasons you need when you, uh, when you receive federal funding, your, your services and your interfaces need to be accessible. Um, that's part of the ADA. There's also um, sort of a lesser known um, but Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, as amended, um, really speaks even more so than the ADA for why we need to be having um, accessible interfaces for all. And we are, as an as information profession, starting to be held accountable for these actions. So it, it's, um, if sort of the general advocacy and trying to improve user experience isn't helpful, you could always try to pull out the big stick. Yeah, these will all uh, help your uh, change the priority of your list of things, and uh, hopefully your institution put more emphasis on accessibility. Thanks, Hanning and Nathan, for the additional information on that. I I do think that um, you know with something uh, as large as accessibility, uh, there is the um, kind of really multi-layered approach of uh, there's clearly things that with your immediate colleagues and trying to get those resources. Uh, but it's clear, um, uh, and certainly it seems like in, in your case, Nathan, is uh, to um, be in a, a situation where there is um, institutional support 
for uh, accessibility. And so um, ensuring that that or, or, or um, trying to communicate upwards if needed, uh, the importance of accessibility. And uh, you know, I'm thinking about some of the things that Valerie said, which is just uh, everyone benefits. And so there's uh, really trying to communicate um, you know, beyond the legal aspects and um, obviously um, uh, there are those um, as well, is just doing the right thing, everyone benefits. Um, it really is really better thinking about your communities and how, how best to serve them. And without a doubt, I would say that uh, institutions do have um, um, principles of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in missions. And I think to really um, make sure that those are implemented rather than just theoretical principles. Um, having those conversations uh, um, seems like a big step um, at institutions is to be talking to colleagues and administration about uh, these larger issues around not just liability, but really the importance um, of doing this um, and making sure that you're um, serving your communities and, and, your, and your missions, um, as well as um, looking to the, at the resources, um, making sure that some of those uh, currently available tools are known to your IT and that they're the, the, the real technical helps uh, to that as well. So um, I think uh, many, many levels to uh, addressing this. Um, and I'm just looking at some additional questions here. Is um, So here's one uh, about, um, I'm interested in how institutions are approaching time-based media. And that's time-based media in our digital collections. Most of us can't afford to immediately transcribe and caption all such media. Are people working on some kind of um, on-demand captioning into their systems? So. Uh, if any of our panelists have any uh, feedback on this, as well as any of our attendees, uh, we'd love to hear some answers to that question. So, Nathan, I, I, I just really want to point out your uh, last time we were meeting, you had the auto caption option on for PowerPoint. That was kind of amazing. Yeah, um, as, as, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and cloud computing, you know, become more dominant and mainstream. Um, if you have, you know, the latest version of Office um, 365 Microsoft PowerPoint, there's now a, a feature where you can turn on live captioning, and, and it's actually pretty good. Um, it's better than most dirty OCR. Um, you know, and if we had, um, um, you know, sort of done a screen share, perhaps, you know, those captions perhaps could have come up. Um, but those, like OCR, are, are not necessarily totally perfect, um, and you do sometimes miss important words that really change the meaning of, of whatever it is that you're trying to convey. Um, but those certainly are, are something to be, to be looked at in this context. Um, uh, for a second, just, so OCR, um, discoverability is not the same thing as accessibility. Sometimes, you know, people say, oh, well, we've OCR'd them, so, you know, they're, they're accessible. That, that's not really the same thing. Um, and so when you, we are doing these live captioning um, or, you know, YouTube has an auto caption feature, um, Kaltura, um, usually if you have that at your organization, has an ability to, to sort of auto-generate machine-based uh, captioning. Um, you know, they're all hit or miss um, as far as the quality, but they do move that ball further. They do get you closer to that end zone and goal of trying to make it accessible. So if you think about accessibility really as iterative, you know, what can you do from the outset? Um, and then how can you improve upon that? And really thinking about, you know, an ecosystem of infrastructure, maybe not just your particular product. So for example, if you have content DM, and you have Kaltura, um, you could work to make Kaltura embedded directly through Content DM, and then the Kaltura captions would be able to show up. You, um, so if you're hosting the media outside of it. Um, so there are sort of creative ways you can think about your infrastructure um, to, to help increase and make that possible. But um, it, it, is, it is true, right? Especially with time-based media, this is a big problem. It's also underfunded. Um, we could advocate more to, to granting agencies um, and others to, to fund these types of activities, that it's not just about content. We need to make sure that people can actually use this content. 
Right. To add to that, uh, specific to content DM, yeah, no, we haven't uh, done anything specific to help with uh, captioning. I think what we we uh, for one, we cannot be responsible for adding caption for your content, but we uh, we would love to be able to pr facilitate. Um, uh, most likely through some sort of customization, embedding a video viewer that will read or display a separate uh, caption file. That that will be what uh, I imagine would be helpful compared to uh, you know burn the captions directly into the video file, which is probably not great. Uh, uh, someone else also mentioned the ability to do other languages, so the with an external um, caption file, we can possibly choose different languages and so on. Uh, we would love to work with some institutions if you're interested in um, improve that uh, captioning um, video play or if um, one's interested. We haven't, uh, we feel bad we haven't get to it. And uh, I think the trend nowadays is that people are, because of the laws in place, um, Organizations are paying more and more attention to these requirements. They're spending the time and effort working on these tools. It's it's promising. So we should all stay tuned and so see our opportunities to make the improvements. Thanks, Hanning. Um, and so. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing in one of the comments here is an important point about including um, patrons, uh, staff, uh, individuals with disabilities um, in uh, feedback on um, on these technologies. And so I'm I'm curious, uh, Nathan, you mentioned um, during the testing. Um, obviously testing by individuals with um, impairments and disabilities. And I'm curious, is there a continuous feedback loop beyond the initial testing phase um, so that there are uh, you know, ongoing ways for individuals who make the most use of these technologies to provide you with feedback? Yes, um, and that's sort of at Penn State um, in sort of an overall um, aspect as well as run a particular product. So the, the software, you know, goes through regular testing itself. So if we're developing, it's worked into those sprints um, and they might, uh, with the IT accessibility office there, have, uh, you know, might have been a person with visual impairment and the next time it might be a person with a hearing impairment. Um, and that sort of uh, goes on to a regular basis. And once um, for Content DM, for example, um, you know, the, the base accessibility, you know, is at a pretty good point. So, so now we're on a schedule of, you know, maybe every year or if there's a really, really major um, change in one of the releases, um, we might do those tests again. Um, our, our library, um, Library Strategic Technology Office has a, a small accessibility team um, and one, per, one FTE. And they sort of have an ongoing review of different um, technologies, and they do at that point bring in as well um, some of our, our patrons and students who have are willing to work with us to test these things out. Um, so that's a really good suggestion, right? Involve your users themselves in, in trying to assess some of these things. I thought it was a really good idea in the chat. Yeah, I think that's that's really a key part of this. And again, is thinking about this um, in ways of really building relationships and outreach and ongoing relationships, so that um, uh, you know libraries know that these uh, tools and um, uh, resources are really best serving uh, the needs of those who who rely on them. Um, so I think that's really important for all of us to uh, remember. And then also, uh, somebody pointed out that uh, public libraries um, are also quite focused on accessibility, and so there may be some um, resources and models and guidance um, looking looking to them. Um, and then uh, we did get a little more clarification regarding that question about metadata uh, metadata schema. I'm more interested in whether perhaps the schema itself should conform to any kind of guidelines or standards uh, to make it or the systems that use the schema more accessible. And I'm just wondering, Nathan, if that provides you with a little more information to add anything more to uh, your original answer. 
I, I, I don't. I'm sorry. I would need some time to, to think on that. I know uh, Kevin Clare in the chat has pointed out a couple accessibility related schemas or aspects out there. Um, you know, I would, I would sort of need to ponder on that and the access, accessibility angles for the metadata schema itself. Um, you know, apart from having lots of variety of see also's, um, perhaps, you know, using emojis instead of uh, character text, um, you know, because then it's a little easier sometimes if you, if you don't know a word, you can still convey an emotive feeling or some some aspect about the content, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared no, for no, that. No, no worries. Thanks, thanks for your thoughts on that, and, and also thanks to Kevin for sharing um, the resources there in chat. And just a reminder uh, that uh, we will be compiling all of the, the resources that were shared by both the panelists and also our attendees and sharing those out um, afterwards when uh, the recording link is shared. Um, and uh, just going to verbalize a few things here where um, Kevin does add there could also be a role in working with um, UX accessibility designers to ensure that metadata appearing in facets isn't confusing or ambiguous when interpreted by screen readers and making adjustments to the schema that way. Um, and that about just takes us to time. Uh, so a very um, Appreciative thank you to our panelists, uh, Nathan, Hanning, and Valerie, for sharing your thoughts, um, your resources, your experiences. Uh, this has been uh, really um, educational and illuminating for, for all of us, and um, always, uh, again, pointing, pointing to ways that, that we can all improve and be uh, more aware of the ways that we could uh, be more accessible to all. And so to all of our attendees, I just want to, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, your engagement, your um, interactivity has been uh, fantastic. We'll post a recording of this webinar online um, in a few days, and I'll notify you by email when that recording is available, and that will include uh, links and slides. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day, and this includes today's webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.